The Wrath of God, part five, and we're almost getting to the finish line. So let's go and take a look. And these are the topics that we've been talking about. So I'm not going to go through the whole list of things. Um, we've gone through quite a bit. But what we're going to talk about today is we're going to look at a passage from the book of Hebrews. And um, there's a passage in there where he talks about, I swore in my wrath. And we're going to read that. And really, that's going to be a proof point about everything that we've been talking about. We've been talking about a picture. We've been looking at a picture. And let's just go there real quick. And this picture here. And we have the kingdom of God on one side. We have the kingdom of darkness on the other side. There's things that we do that draw us into preservation protection. Then if we live a certain way in sin and fear and unbelief, if we rebel or reject God, then we draw closer to the devil and we become more exposed to his works. And you know the work of the devil is wrath with violence. The work of God is wrath in terms of him forsaking you because you've basically made a decision to live a certain way where you don't want to live in his house. And so he lets you go. And so that's the major message of this whole teaching is that wrath from God's perspective is that essentially he's like a parent who kicked an unruly teenager out of the house. You know, he's put you out on your own. You don't have the blessings. You don't have the protection. You don't have his help. And when you're outside of God's help, you know, that's when the devil who is full of violent wrath comes and does his work. And so the, the key thing here is that God's not violent. He's not the one who's hurting us and harming us. And so we're going to see that exemplified in this passage in Hebrews. Then what we'll do is we'll look at some scriptures we're very familiar with that we use for rightly dividing the Bible. And they clearly discern the works of God versus the works of the devil. And they're just my go-to scriptures whenever I need to interpret a passage or I have a question about the character or nature of God and something I'm reading I will refer to these passages and I'll always have my answer there. Okay, then we're going to look at this terrible example, the wrath and curse destruction event of AD 70. That's when Jerusalem was absolutely just slaughtered. And so we're going to look at all those prophecies from the Old Testament. And then we're going to read a little article from Josephus, who was a historian uh, in that day. Like back in AD 70, he lived through this. He saw it with his own eyes and he wrote about it. And so we'll see a layperson's account of some of the atrocities that happen in this wrath curse event. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll take these scriptures that we looked at, the rightly dividing ones, and we'll apply them to this wrath curse passage. Okay. And then next time, we're going to finish up next time for sure. We might look at one more example of a wrath passage. And then there was a question on YouTube where somebody was questioning this whole concept that God would kind of kick you out of the house or forsake you or hide his face from you for a moment. He was questioning that because, you know, this, the Bible also says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And so that's actually a good question. And, and just a real quick answer is God said he wouldn't leave us, but he didn't say we wouldn't leave him. Okay, so that's kind of the that's the summary there. So it, it is possible for us to walk away from him and experience hardship once again. So we don't want to do that. Okay, so let's go on. So I swore in my wrath. Okay, so we go to Hebrews chapter 3. Um, we're going to read um, from verse 7 until chapter 4, verse 2. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they, will, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Okay, this is wrath from God's perspective. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we behold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, 
While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Okay, so first of all, so everything in yellow is kind of going in a negative direction and the stuff in blue is kind of what we need to be aware of to take action on. Okay, so let's just talk through a few things here. So first of all, what caused the so-called wrath of God in this passage? Okay, so we see some of these things in yellow. They didn't listen to God and receive his word so that, you know, so as to be established in faith and be established in his will. You know, so instead of that, they hardened their hearts. So it says, if you will hear his voice. Okay, well, they, they heard it and they rejected it. They hardened their hearts. You know, so if we have God's word in the Bible, right, somebody could tell us a prophecy and we could have God's word, or God could speak to us directly in our thoughts and we could have a word from God. The question is, you know, are we going to accept the words of God that are given to us, whether in the Bible or elsewhere, or are we going to harden our hearts against them? So these people, they harden their heart against God, and that was the primary thing. They didn't listen to God and receive his word in order to be established in faith and be established in his will. Instead, they rebel. <laughs> they rebelled against God's will, right? Okay. Secondly, their hearts became hardened to God due to sin and rebellion against him. Okay, so it talks about re rebellion in verse 8. It talks about sin in verse 13. They became hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, so the more you persist, like, for example, when a person sins for the first time, you know, or they're consciously aware of sinning, you know, you have a conscience, you know, so we're, God has given us a conscience, like, so we know right from wrong. But as you continue to participate in sin and you sin more and more and more regularly, your conscience becomes dimmed. It's, it's like it's the volume on your conscience is being turned down and you just don't hear it anymore. And so that's, that's the process talked about in Romans chapter one, where God gives us over to a debased mind, you know, and so you, you become hardened to your conscience. You become hardened against God as you persist in sin. And so we don't want to do that like these people did. And he's warning us about that also in this passage. Okay, then the third thing is it says they had evil hearts um, that did not believe in God, but rather they were in unbelief, having departed from faith in God. Okay, so it says right here in verse 12, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Okay, so God considers it to be evil, like not believing in God. That's actually evil, you know, because we're, we're calling God a liar. We're rejecting him. We're rebelling against him by not believing in him. And so that is a form of evil, even though it's not like violence or adultery, but it's, it's rejection of him, right? And, and so that's, that is sin, and he considers that to be evil. Okay, and so notice also what we just talked about. You know, when I mentioned this last point, God will never leave you or forsake you. Well, that's true, but you can leave God, right? It says right here, it says, Beware, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So it's us that would be departing from God, not him departing from us. Amen? So it is possible for somebody to walk away from God. Okay, so, so anyway, those are the major factors that were causing the problem, okay? And because of their rejection of God, then he said, they're not going to enter my rest, which means they're not going to have my help. They're not going to have protection. They're not going to have just the normal blessings that you would have when you're in faith in God. So what exactly was God's wrath? Well, in point A, they couldn't enter God's rest because they didn't have his help and protection, Okay, so they're wandering around in the desert for 40 years. They didn't enter into the promised land. They, um, they had lots of trial and tribulation because they didn't have God's help. 
And so when we're in faith, when we're aligned with God, then we're going to have protection. We're going to have blessing. We're going to have grace. We're going to have favor. We're going to have mercy. We're going to have all kinds of good things that are available to us if we're believing in him and trusting in him. Well, they didn't have any of that. And and in fact, they were basically, they were on their own and they had to fend for themselves. You know, again, it's, I like the example where if you're a parent and you have an unruly, sinful teenager and you kick them out of the house because they're just totally violating all of your your rules and regulations, they're violating your moral standards, you know, they're, they're living sinfully, you know, in whatever manner, you know, a, a parent would kick them out of the house because they're a troublemaker. Well, in the same way, these were essentially kicked out of the house because they were troublemakers or unbelieving or sinful or whatever. They were rebelling against God. So he kicked them out of the house, figuratively speaking. And so that means they were on their own and they didn't have the benefits that they would normally have when they're in a close relationship with God. And so they were lacking his help because of sin. They struggled for 40 years in the desert and they all ended up, all except two of them, ended up dying in the wilderness. Amen. And so it wasn't that God committed evil against them. It's that they rebelled against him. They rejected God and then they drew close to the devil and experienced the devil's violent wrath, curse, death, and so forth. Amen? Because they were over here, they were in unbelief, they were in sin, and they were in rebellion, according to the passage, right, that we just read. So they utterly had rejected God, and so they're way outside of God's protection. They're over here in the devil's camp, and so they're going to experience bad things. It's not God doing the bad things to them. It's just that they drew near to the devil because of their rejection of God. Amen? So God is good, but, you know, if we choose to live according to the devil's standards and not according to God's standards, then eventually we're going to find ourselves far outside of his protection, blessing, favor, victory, and so forth. And then bad things will happen because, because of vulnerability. Okay, so what's the remedy for this? So the remedy is also in this passage. So it says we need to exhort one another to build faith and avoid unbelief. So if you look at verse 13, it says, you know, beware of unbelief. You know, beware of departing from God. You depart from God by not having faith in him. You depart from God by being in unbelief as opposed to being in belief, in faith. And so that's why he says, exhort one another. So the purpose of exhortation is where we just boost each other up in faith. And so as we're chit-chatting in WhatsApp, you know, we, we may be exhorting one another. As we're praying for one another and we're getting testimonies, we're exhorting one another. You know, every time we tell a faith story, we're exhorting one another. Every time we do a Bible teaching, we're exhorting one another. And so those things that we do, um, that raises that raises us up in faith. And so that helps keep us from entering into unbelief. It helps keep us from departing from, from God himself. Amen? So that's important. And then secondly, he says we need to hold on to faith in Christ and do not turn away from him. And that is in verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ if, if, okay, so there's a, there's a responsibility for us. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, meaning we have to, we have to remain in faith. We have to remain, you know, in pursuit of God, in, in relationship with God, in communion with God, in believing in God. So there's a responsibility on us. You know, if the relationship falls apart, it's not it's not God's fault that it fell apart. It would be our fault. You know, so we have to motivate one another. We have to stay motivated in our relationship with God. We have to stay believing and stay in faith. Keep believing in Jesus. Amen. And then the third thing is we need to listen to the word of God and mix faith with it through Bible study. Um, through Bible study, through consuming testimonies, and by putting faith into practice. Okay, so it says over here, let's see, it says right here in chapter 4, verse 2, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Okay, so they heard the word of God, but it, it didn't register with them. Their hearts were hardened. They rejected it. They rebelled against it. 
So the word of God did not sink into them and they got no benefit from it. And so you can see that they had no protection, no blessing, no favor or anything like that because they rejected his word. So what we need to do is we need to, we need to seek to, we need, we need to choose to pursue faith. Like faith is a choice. Like we choose either to fight against the scripture or we choose to believe it and then seek to enrich our belief in that scripture. Right? So like, when I heard about divine healing, for example, I was excited. I'm like, man, this is so good. Like, how come I never heard this before? You know, so I was eager to want to prove that divine healing is a true thing. So I had, I had made up my mind. I want to believe in this. This is a good thing. I want to believe in it. Okay. But then you have other Christians, you know, they believe in Jesus for certain things, but they're like, no, no, no. You know, you know, if it's, it's not his will for everyone to be healed, you know, if it was God's will for everyone to be healed, there wouldn't be any sick people. And, and they're fighting against the scripture, right? So there's people that fight against the scripture and there's people that embrace the scripture. How are you going to respond to it? And so we need to be those who are fighting for the scripture, fighting to believe in the scripture. And the way we do that is Bible study, testimonies, and then very importantly, we need to put our faith into practice. You know, until you put your faith into practice, you really don't know what you have. And so we put our faith into practice when we pray for each other, we're exercising our faith. When we pray for ourselves, we're exercising our faith. And so every time we get a victory, whether it's you praying for you or you praying for me, it doesn't matter. Like every time you get a victory or every time you participate in a faith victory, you just get raised up, you get strengthened and your faith is getting stronger. Your confidence in God is getting stronger. And those are the things we need to keep doing. Amen. All right, so we want to mix faith with the Word of God. And then lastly, we need to avoid sin, and we need to seek to do His will to avoid the hardening of the heart. Okay, because he says right here, he says, where did it go? Well, like in verse 15, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, a sinful rebellion. So we want to stay out of sin, stay out of rebellion, and avoid the hardening of the heart. And we want to hear his word, believe his word, and seek to do his will. Um, and when we say seek to do his will, we want to do the do's and don't do the don'ts. And not in a legalistic way, but we want to, we already have it inside of us. Like inside of us, we want to do good things. We want to be helpful. We want to pray for people. We want to do good things, but we need to embrace that and actually carry it out, right? Um, at the same time, we also know inside of our heart, we shouldn't do this, that, or the other thing you know, sinful things, you know, sins of commission, we know inside of our heart that it's wrong to do those things. And we need to make sure that we're actually resisting the devil and we don't enter into those temptations and enter into sins of commission, right? So we want to do the good deeds that we know we're supposed to do, and we want to avoid the bad deeds that we know we're not supposed to do. Okay. All right. So then number five, so if you believe then you will be in a rest of faith in which God will take care of you. He will protect you. He will provide for you. He will heal you. He will bless you. If you disbelieve, however, then you miss his rest and you suffer as the world suffers. His wrath is against unbelief and his wrath is the absence of his help in life to varying degrees. His wrath is that he turns away from you for a moment and then we experience the devil in greater degrees because we're outside of God's protection. In God's wrath, he still offered some help to these children of Israel in their 40 years wandering around. So he, he wasn't 100% departed from them, but they didn't have very much benefit at all, right? So the key thing is, let's um, be rich in faith, let's stay out of sin, let's be busy doing good deeds, align with God's will, and we're going to do well. Amen? Okay, so I want to look at a wrath passage. So before we read the wrath passages, let's uh, talk about scriptures for rightly dividing. So I have some categories here, sickness, death, curse, and punishment. And I'm probably not going to read through all of these, but we can just kind of peruse through them real quick. So on the topic of sickness, you know, there's certain denominations and they'll teach, you know, God put that sickness on you to teach you something. And, uh, you know, or God's punishing you with sickness or something like that, right? So they think that God's actually responsible for sickness. Well, the Bible clearly tells us in Acts 10.38 that actually the devil is the one who's responsible for sickness. So it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth 
with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. So all those thousands of people that Jesus healed, um, they were under the law, right? Um, all those thousands of people that Jesus healed, they were all oppressed by the devil. And so God's not the oppressor. The devil is the oppressor. And we have Father, Father God, and Jesus, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. All three are in agreement about this good work of setting people free from oppression of the devil by healing the sick and healing them all. Amen. So anytime somebody has a healing need, the devil did it in some form or fashion. Okay, and we know that Jesus, he paid for our healing. He bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. And by his stripes, we are healed. So Jesus paid for us to be healed and whole. So that is the will of God, to be healed. It is the will of, devil, of the devil for you to be sick and to die. Okay, if we look at death. So we have many passages here, and there's even more than this, but let's just look at a couple of them. So you know, when Jesus and his disciples were walking around, they came to a village of the Samaritans, and the village of Samaritans rejected Jesus. And, um, you know, that seems like a pretty bad thing to do, right? You don't want to reject Jesus. And so Jesus' disciples said, do you, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? And so the disciples thought it was a good thing to call down fire and burn these people alive who, <laughs> who rejected Jesus. So, you know, they get that from the Old Testament, right? But Jesus rebuked them. So he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Okay, it's the devil's manner of spirit. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And we know Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's never a destroyer. He's never a killer. He's never a maker sicker. He's never a curse bringer. He's never uh, a cruel punisher or anything like that. Amen. He is always a savior, never a destroyer. If we go to Hebrews 2.14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, so this is the most clear passage of all. Um, Jesus came to this earth for the purpose of destroying the devil who has the power of death. Amen? So the devil has the power of death. And it looks like I have the same passage twice here from 1 Corinthians. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, we see the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So death is not God's tool. Death is not God's instrument. On the contrary, death is God's enemy. It's also mankind's enemy. It's from the devil. And and it will be destroyed. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So death is not our father's tool, but he did send Jesus to be the answer to this problem. Amen? Okay, so the point here is that any killing that we find, any making sick that we find anywhere in the Bible, um, it's always the work of the devil. And anywhere, anytime in, in real life, it's always the work of the devil. Okay, what about curse? So John 10.10, Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Okay, so any kind of stealing, killing, and destroying, it's, it's of the devil. So if you look at the curses, you'll see many different varieties of stealing, killing, and destroying. Even like the stealing of children, like taking them into captivity, um, all kinds of, of slaughter, death, destruction of many different varieties, all that stuff is in the curses, right? And so Jesus is the answer to that. He came to give us life and life abundantly. If we look at Galatians 3.13, now this is especially important. We talked about it in some of the prior teachings in this series. Wrath and curse, curse and wrath, they mean the same thing. And we can see that in the New Testament because the words are used interchangeably in some passages. Okay, so if you're redeemed from curse, which we're about to read, then you're also redeemed from wrath. You're redeemed from wrath. You're redeemed from curse. Jesus took it all. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Okay, so Jesus, he already bore the curse for us. And so he fulfilled the law he, to redeem us from the law. He bore the curse to redeem us from curse. And in order to get these benefits, we simply need to have faith in Jesus. And so back here 
when it said, we need to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So we need to keep on believing. It's not sufficient that we believed that Jesus redeemed us from curse at one point in time. We need to keep believing. We need to always be believing. And so one of the things we can do that's really powerful is a daily confession of scripture. And this would be one of the passages. It's actually on my confession list. You know, Galatians 3.13 I'll make a, a declaration of faith out of this passage. So I want to keep scriptures alive and well and fresh inside of me. I want them, I want to be rich in faith in a wide set of topics at all times. And so scripture confession is a powerful tool to do that. Uh, also testimonies are as well. Okay. So we are redeemed from curse. We are redeemed from wrath. Only be believing in Jesus and don't let that fade. Okay. If we talk about punishment, Okay, so let's just paraphrase these. There was a woman that was caught in adultery and, you know, under the law, you can stone them to death. You know, the law, in, in fact, it instructs to stone somebody to death if they're caught in adultery. And so these Pharisees, you know, they wanted to see what Jesus was going to do. And so they brought this woman caught in adultery to Jesus and he refused to condemn her to death. He said, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know, so Jesus, he simply wants us to, sin, to stop sinning, start doing the right thing, stop sinning, but he doesn't want us to be condemned. He doesn't want the death sentence, the death penalty to come to pass. Okay, we have the passage where, you know, all the people came to arrest Jesus and Peter drew his sword and he cut off Malchus's ear and Jesus healed him. I mean, so this guy is leading Jesus away to be tortured and killed. He got his ear chopped off, and Jesus, instead of saying, "Ha, huh, you got what you deserved," instead of that, you know, he he put his ear back on. You know, so he blessed his enemy. And then one more, you know, when Jesus was crucified. So first of all, they'd already like had beaten him. They had already put stripes on him. They had already stripped him and ridiculed him and crowned him with thorns. And then they just freshly nailed him to the cross. And so he's already in the process. His murder is in process. He's already nailed. And he's like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Jesus, you know, he wasn't a he wasn't repaying like an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. He wasn't having violent vengeance or revenge or anything like that. In fact, he he taught us to bless our enemies, and we can see him doing the same thing in these passages. Okay? So you can take these scriptures. And you can use them to rightly divide almost any passage in the Bible. So you can always find your answer here. If there's sickness, the devil did it. If there's death and destruction, the devil did it. If there's curse or wrath, the devil did it. If there's some ungodly, you know, repayment of evil with evil, that's not God. That's the devil. Okay, so all your answers are on this page. Okay, now let's talk about the wrath and you know, or curse, destruction of AD 70. So last week when we talked about hell, um, hell plays into this. You know, and so we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get going here. So first, let's start back in the Old Testament. There were prophecies back in the, like throughout the Old Testament, talking about a terrible time that was going to come upon um, Jerusalem. So in Deuteronomy 28, uh, verses 25 to 26. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. Your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. Okay, so he's prophesying that if they were to rebel, one of the things that would happen is there would be a slaughter because there would be carcasses everywhere, and there would be no one to pick up the carcasses, and therefore the, the carcasses of people would become food for birds and, and beasts, right? And so that's a disgraceful way to die. It's a disgraceful, you know, lack of proper treatment after death, lack of burial. So it's very disgraceful, right? If we go on in the curses to verse 52 to 57, they shall besiege you. Your enemies shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust Come down throughout all your land, and they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you. 
in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat, because he has nothing left in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. The tender and delicate woman among you, who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity, will refuse to her husband of her bosom, and to her son and her daughter, her placenta, which comes out from between her feet, and her children, whom she bears, for she will eat them secretly, for lack of everything in the siege and desperate straits, in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. Okay, remember when Jesus was talking about not one stone would be left upon another? He's talking about this event right here. Right? He's talking about this event. He's talking about um, they're trusting in their gates and their fortified walls, all of which will be brought down. Yeah. You remember Jesus said, woe to the nursing mothers. Why did he say that? Because of this terrible curse where they're going to eat their children. They're going to eat placenta. They're going to be like secretive. They won't tell you know, one another, hey, I have, you know, I have, I'm eating Bob over here, but I'm not going to share Bob with you, you know, or, or whatever his name is. You know, they're literally eating their own children and they're like hiding it from one another. So this was like a terrible, terrible, terrible thing that was prophesied. It was a curse, right? And we know curses are from the devil. All of this atrocity, it's the will and the work of the devil. It's not the will and the work of God. Okay, so we have to rightly divide because when you read the Old Testament, you get a different idea. And it shall be... And just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. Okay, we're going to compare and contrast this with Jesus in just a minute, because he was crying over Jerusalem. He wasn't throwing a party and rejoicing. So we know that in the writing of the Old Testament, there's a veil. There's a veil over the Old Testament. And, and a veil lies on your heart when you read the Old Testament because it's written as though father and devil are written together as one person. And so um, that's the confusion. That, that is the major confusion with the entire Old Testament. And so once we come become aware of that, and once we use these scriptures over here to rightly divide, then we can get freedom over that. We'll get clarity. And so we're going to compare and contrast this with, with Jesus, and we'll see that truly... Jesus, who's the revealed image of God, he was not throwing a party and rejoicing about curse. In fact, he was crying about it. Okay, so let's look at Jeremiah. So he's prophesying the same event, the destruction of AD 70. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no longer be called Tophet or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. The corpses of this people will be food for the birds of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. Okay, so he's prophesying that there's a terrible curse coming upon Jerusalem. And remember we looked at the map. Let's just go back to the map. Okay, so here's Jerusalem, and here is this area right here, you see this light yellow area here? This is called Hinnom Valley, or it's called the Son of Hinnom, or it's called um, Gehenna, or it's wrongly called Hell in, in English in some Bible translations. So this is a physical place on earth, and this is where all those heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of bodies were thrown in the slaughter of AD 70. Because Hinnom Valley had become like the, the trash dump for Jerusalem. Like way, way, way back in time, um, they, they actually called it Tophet, a place, which means a place of burning. It was called Tophet because they were sacrificing their children to Molech, and so they were burning the children alive in their sacrifices to Molech. And then later it was called different things like um, the Valley of Hinnom, the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, um, later in the, the days of the, the Greek influence, it was called Gehenna. Gay Hena, um, which means you know the son of Hinnom or the Valley of Hinnom, rather. So all those are the same thing, but this is a physical place on Earth. 
So all those times that Jesus was talking about a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, it has nothing to do with spiritual. It has to do with physical. Okay? So we'll see that again. Okay. So, so Jeremiah is saying that there's going to be a great slaughter. It's going to be so bad that they're going to rename it from the Valley of Hinnom to the Valley of Slaughter. And then he's saying the same thing that was said back in Deuteronomy where there's going to be so many dead bodies that there's not going to be anyone to frighten the way the birds and the beasts that come to, to eat the people that have been slaughtered. So it's really a very disgraceful way to die. And plus, it's a huge, tremendous slaughter that was being prophesied. So this is a curse. And then we have Isaiah 66, 24. And it says, and they, and this is talking about living, breathing people, and they, living people, shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Okay, now this is extremely important. We talked about it last time, but I'll say it again. This is extremely important. The entire body of Christ almost believes that all those times Jesus was talking about Passages like in Mark chapter 9, so let's just read it. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell and to the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Okay, so this is the major set of passages where people get the idea that there's an eternal fiery hell pit and you're just burning alive. Okay, so it's from all the times that Jesus said this, because in their Bible, it says, go to hell. Okay, but it doesn't say, there's no such word as hell that comes from the Greek. Okay, we talked about it last time. There's four words that have been, four original language words that were brought into English as the single word hell, and that's where the confusion comes in. So in this passage, it really, it says Gehenna, uh, Gehenna, which means Valley of Hinnom, or the Valley of the Son of Hinnom. This is a physical place on earth. So we just looked at the map. So on that south, southern side of Jerusalem, there is a valley down there. And that valley was a trash dump. And they would they would put trash in there. They would put you know dead animals, dead people. And then wherever you have trash and dead bodies, what do you have? You have maggots. You have worms. And you have fires burning to consume the trash. That is a physical place on earth. It has nothing to do with anything spiritual. Okay? Well, it's, it's just, it's curse. You know, it's unfortunate. Now, if their parents would have been in faith and would have listened to the word of God, then it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't come upon the children either. It's a curse. It's a bad thing. It's a work of the devil. And the only way to avoid these is by way of faith, you know, aligning yourself with the will of God. And so Jesus is telling people in Mark 9, 43 to 44, he's like, you know, stay out of sin because the law is still in effect, you know, when he's speaking, stay out of sin, you know, don't rebel against God. Because you don't want to suffer this curse that's coming, where there's going to be a great slaughter, where they're going to throw all the dead bodies into Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom, and there's going to be worms and fire, and the physical worms and physical fire eating the consuming the bodies of the people who were cast into it. Okay, so you make the connection here, so you can see like this passage in Deuteronomy uh, 28 verse 25 to 26. This is the same thing as over here in Jeremiah 7, 32 to 33 is the same thing as Isaiah 66, 24. These are all the same thing is the same thing as Jesus where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched because he's quoting from Isaiah 66, 24. And he's talking about physical and they living, breathing people will go forth and this is after, upon the destruction of AD 70, they will go forth and they will look upon corpses. These are physical, <laughs> physical corpses of men who transgressed against me. Transgress means broke the law. You know, they rebelled against God. And um, for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So this is physical. There's physical people walking around, looking at corpses, 
that are consumed with worms and consumed with fire and the things that they see with their eyes, these living people, this flesh, that sees all these disgusting, rotting, fire-burning, worm-eaten bodies, it's an abhorrence to them. This is a physical event. This is the aftermath of the destruction of AD 70 in which all these things came to pass. I mean, this was after, you know, Jerusalem, like almost the entire place, they rejected Jesus. They rejected their salvation. You know, he, he was constantly performing miracles in all these different places. All these miracles he did, all the preaching that he did, and some believed, but most did not. And then unfortunately for them, they rejected salvation. And so they were outside of God's help and this disaster came upon them. The disaster is not the work of God, but the, the work of the devil. But because they had put themselves outside of God's will and rejected their salvation, they're on their own. And so they had no defense. And so that's a very sad and unfortunate thing, although an answer was available to them, but they just did not accept it. So Jesus warned against sin because it would be transgression, and the word transgression means law-breaking, which would result in receiving curse, such as the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, which was prophesied in the passages above. This destruction would cause massive death to come upon Jerusalem to the point that there was no more room to bury, and the bodies would be in heaps, being eaten by birds, beasts, worms, and consumed with fire. All of this would be on public display for people to see, and it would be an abhorrence to them. The Jews became a reproach, a scorn, and a derision to neighboring people. So there's many other passages in the Old Testament that prophesy of the same event, but this is just a couple of them, right? And so Jesus was warning the people. He was trying to tell them, you know, don't sin, don't break the law, because he didn't want this curse to come upon them. He wanted people to believe in him. Um, let's read in Luke chapter 21. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay, so Jesus is like warning them. You know, he's, he's like giving them many, you know, hints. <laughs> It's like, you know, listen, you know, a time is coming and it's not that far away when all these terrible things are going to happen. And so you can see here in verse 23, he even is alluding to the what's going to happen with the babies. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And then you go back to all these passages in the curse, the curses, and they're going to end up eating their own children. They're going to eat the babies. They're going to eat the placenta because they're starved to death because they've been choked out by their enemy surrounded by enemies so he's trying to warn the people but they just wouldn't listen so we we saw this problem like back in deuteronomy it says the lord will rejoice over you to destroy you okay well you know do we really believe that well let's look at jesus and see what jesus thinks now as he drew near jerusalem he saw the city and wept over it saying if you had known even you especially in this your day the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Okay, so Jesus, who is the image of God, he's not throwing a party and rejoicing about a curse coming upon them. So this is a devilish mindset over here in verse 63. That's not the mindset of God. That's the devil who rejoices to destroy. The devil's the one who has the power of death and destruction. So he's the one who's having a party, killing everybody. Jesus, who is the revealed image of God, he saw Jerusalem and he's thinking about these terrible things that are going to happen to it. You know, all this great slaughter, these corpses everywhere, rotting flesh, and so forth. He's thinking about all this, and he's crying. He wept over Jerusalem. And then he's lamenting because, you know, he, he wishes that they would have paid attention. If you had known, 
the things that make for your peace. Well, all the time he's preaching and teaching and he's healing the sick and they just didn't accept it, right? So they rejected the things that made for their peace. They rejected their salvation through Jesus. They rejected it all. And so he's crying about that. He's upset. So he's not throwing a party and having a good time. He's upset because the will of God is he wants people to be saved. The will of God is I have not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And so it upsets him. It it breaks his heart when people reject their salvation, which is what happened in Jerusalem. In the other version of this passage, it says, you know, so many times I wanted to gather you under my wings as a as a, a hand gathers her chicks, right? But they but you were not willing. So his will and his effort was to bring about salvation, but there was a rejection that happened. And so then what happened is, you know, once once people start pushing back against God, a hardening of the heart happens, and the devil comes and exasperates that, and you know, he further will come and harden the hearts. He will, remember it says in Ephesians that he blinds the minds, or in multiple places it says he's he's the one who blinds the minds of those who do not believe. And so you can see that happening, but now they are hidden from your eyes. The devil has blinded them. So they can't even see their salvation anymore. Right? So it's a sad thing. Okay, so so anyway, so let's let's read from a historian's perspective. The Siege of Jerusalem by Josephus. Among the residents of the region beyond Jordan was a woman called Mary, daughter of Eleazar of the village of Bethzuba. The name means house of hyssop. She was well off and of good family and had fled to Jerusalem with her relatives where she became involved with the siege. Most of the property she had packed up and brought with her from Perea had been plundered by the tyrants, Simon and John, leaders of the Jewish war effort, and the rest of her treasure, together with such foods as she had been able to procure, was being carried by their henchmen in their daily raids. In her bitter resentment, the poor woman cursed and, ab and abused these extortioners, and this incensed them against her. However, no one put her to death, either from exasperation or pity. She grew weary of trying to find food for her kinsfolk. In any case, it was by now impossible to get any wherever you tried. Famine gnawed at her vitals, and the fire of rage was ever fiercer than famine. So driven by fury and want, she committed a crime against nature. Seizing her child, an infant at the breast, she cried, My poor baby! Why should I keep you alive in this world of war and famine? Even if we live till the Romans come, they will make slaves of us. And anyway, hunger will get us before slavery does. And the rebels are crueler than both. Come, be food for me. And an avenging fury to the rebels and a tale of horror to the world to complete the monstrous agony of the Jews. With these words, she killed her son, roasted the body, swallowed half of it, and stored the rest in a safe place. But the rebels were on her at once, smelling roasted meat and threatening to kill her instantly if she did not produce it. She assured them she had saved them a share and revealed the remains of her child. Seized with horror and stupef stupefaction, they stood paralyzed at the sight. But she said, this is my own child and my own handiwork. Eat, for I have eaten already. Do not show yourselves weaker than a woman or more pitiful than a mother. If you have pious scruples and shrink away from human sacrifice, then what I have eaten can count as your share, and I will eat what is left as well. At that they slunk away, trembling, not daring to eat, although they were reluctant to yield even this food to the mother. The whole city soon rang with the abomination. When people heard of it, they shuddered as though they had done it themselves. Okay, so this is a factual story. This is written by a, his, a historian who witnessed, you know, these events and many other events, and he wrote about it. And there, you can find his writings are still available today. So this just goes to show that, you know, Jesus is warning, you know, woe to the pregnant mothers. You know, it's talking about this curse back here, eating the flesh of your own children. Amen. So, so the bottom line is that all of this terrible atrocity this so-called wrath of God, 
Because remember over here, Jesus is rever referring to this event as a wrath event. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Well, it wasn't God doing these evil things, but the people, by way of their rejection of their salvation, they were outside of God's help. And whenever somebody gets outside of God's help, then they're an easy victim to the devil. And so the devil brought all these curses that were prophesied. He brought them upon Jerusalem, and it was unhindered. There was nobody to stop them. They, were, they rejected God already, and so the devil just had his way, and this atrocity came upon Jerusalem. So all of this is the work of the devil. It's not the work of God. Amen?